Hello, 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 and welcome to this week's episode of What They Did Not Teach You in School. Today is episode number 37. I have two very special guests on the podcast today. I have Logan Wolf and Kieran McConnell. I've actually known you guys for quite some time now. Kieran, like three years, four mm-hmm. years, and Logan, like... Like 10. Almost at least, 10. At least 10, yeah. Yeah, like almost 10 Nine, years 10 now. Years, yeah. And um, I've been waiting to have both of you guys on the podcast for a while, especially as we were going through the pandemic, because like there were so many things just for both of us that happened during that period of time, especially you, Logan, that like has been an absolute game changer for us. And we've experienced that wave during the pandemic. But the problem that I had during that period of time is that I was waiting for the opportunity to have you on a podcast in person. So give me some, give me a little bit of this. Join in, Kieran. Yes. I don't know what this is. <laughs> it builds rapport between the people. Okay. You can't get that if you're doing a podcast virtually. No. You know no, what no, I'm no, saying? No, 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 no. 100%. Okay. Before we get started, though, I do want to have a word from our sponsors. <laughs> Today's episode is sponsored by Creator Club. Creator Club is a marketplace that connects brands and content creators in an easy process in order to scale your content marketing. I want to thank Valentina behind the camera, the icon being able to help us with the production today, as well as J Fish B, Jesse Fishbaum. Uh, he helped a lot with the research and preparation and content strategy behind this episode. Okay, let's get started. Kieran, give us an intro of who you are. Okay, wow. How do I give an intro about myself? All right, so my name is Kieran McConnell. Um, I'm a management consultant at Accenture right now somewhat recent grad from Queens University and kind of an enigma in terms of how I grew up. Lived in seven different countries, uh, but all in all, I'm Canadian, born in Toronto, moved back here in May. So uh, yeah, I used to work with the team behind Creator Club. Uh, Sound such good friends with Anthony and um, yeah, just sort of building out my career from the ground floor as what a I, humble 23 year old. What I find most interesting about Kieran is that uh, he has the perfect uh, mix, in my opinion, of the science and the art of like economics and like physics, et cetera, how the world works, as well as like the art side. You're a great communicator, an amazing storyteller, and writer. And I vibe with that. Thanks mm-hmm. for being on the episode. We've been trying to do this for a long time. We have, yeah. I, I used to work on this podcast, so yeah. I'm very, very happy. It was to be actually, on it, it was actually like a year ago where we were like, okay, we're going to start the third, uh, the fifth season. Yeah, let's start like co- coordinating, and we asked Logan to be on on the podcast, mm-hmm. and then we tried finding a physical space, and there were none. Mm. Right? Yeah. Can I just comment on how freaking nice this space is? Because I, I remember when you guys first came up with the idea, it was just like, call up Daniel. There's no podcast studios. Are we doing this? Yeah, yeah. Make it. A few months later, you have this. This is incredible. Well, I don't know about a few months later. It's been like eight to ten months later. But in the grand scheme of your life, that's a few months. Thanks. I appreciate that. That's true. And uh, the second person that we have on the podcast today is Logan Wolf. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself for the listeners that don't know who you are? Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, my name is Logan. I'm a, I define myself as, a, as an entrepreneur, I guess. Um, I'm a management consultant as well. Um, Started with risk and cybersecurity, some pretty large deals. I've switched to um, consulting startups and coaching startup um, founders primarily. Uh, I've been pretty nerdy. I don't know. So we're going way back here. Um, since I was like 12 years old, I was into technology. I started by, I don't know, coding video game characters and then just uh, kicking my friends' asses with them. It was pretty fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, that was the 2D age. Um, I have. Uh, started some successful, some not so much companies, primarily in the tech space. Uh, that's how we've met, actually, with uh, Tony. My, f- our, my first ever startup that I worked at was uh, I know the startup that you yeah. uh, first kicked off, and you were the founder and CEO. Yeah. And it, what was impressive to me was that it was back when like Kickstarter was like the wild, wild west, mm. you know, before they got super regulated and like rules and shit like that, right? <laughs> and you had, a, and you had a, a Kickstarter campaign for an AI that was supposed to like do everything for you. Actually, before AI was like a popular thing. Realistically, the only AI that was out at the time was Siri. That's true. Um, there was that uh, hype wave though. Like most people's idea of an AI was based on like Jarvis, you right. know, and Terminator. <laughs> Which you created a video on Kickstarter that yeah. really got people's attention. You raised something like what? What was it? It was like 70K, but 
which uh, is a lot on Kickstarter. I, I guess yeah, back in the day, I mean, you know, uh, Oculus Rift, they raised like 13 million, but, um, did they actually, Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was nuts. Uh, they, they've been asking like two. I remember that. They yeah. got way overfunded. That's crazy. Huh? But then there was this guy who was making potato salad and he raised like 60 G's. So. <laughs> hey, you beat the guy with potato salad. Yeah, no shit. Yeah. So that's actually how I first <laughs> met you. Um, and now go ahead, continue on with your story. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, so entrepreneur consultant, uh, I've written a few books uh, on design and entrepreneurship. Uh, one of them is Iconic by Design, it's probably my favorite. I'm big on design. Um, I'm a huge automotive enthusiast. I race cars, I fix them, I collect them. Um, yeah, at this point, I'm a founder and CEO of a cybersecurity startup named uh, Orna. Yeah, that's been your latest thing. It is, yes. Okay, we'll get a little bit more into that in a second because particularly uh, surrounding cybersecurity, it's massive right now, especially in the news and like the future. An interconnected world on dig- on like the internet is only going to become more and more accessible to cybersecurity attacks. Um, so we definitely will circle back on that. Okay. Fantastic. All right, let's dive into it. So Kieran, uh, today, so today's episode, we're going to get a little bit of a glimpse into like management consulting, the management consulting world for people that are like listening and they're in high school or university and they want to get into consulting. We're going to talk about that career trajectory, but also people that are in consulting right now that are looking to kind of leave and get into the entrepreneurship game. We're going to talk about how that transition um, has played out for you, Logan, and some tips and tricks for them uh, to look out for or the mindset and things that they should know before doing so. Okay. Um, so, Kieran, you joined Accenture as a management consultant this year, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, what intrigued you about that position? What first got you interested in that? It, it was a combination of things. Um, there was one aspect where I've always been really interested in, like, the tech startup space. Um, so learning as much as I could about like kind of bleeding edge, cutting edge technologies was really kind of where I wanted to steer myself towards. And however that manifested, I wanted to just sort of be in that spot. So um, Accenture being the you know tech corner of of the management consulting space, that's what kind of drove me towards that company. But there, there was a few other things about management consulting that that I found interesting. W- one of them was t- to your point about you know me having a very like diverse, versatile background. Uh, not a lot of professions really let you unleash that versatility. Um, there's not a lot of times when, you know, if you're an engineer, you're doing purely technical stuff. Or if you're an investment banker, you're doing purely business things. Um, there's oftentimes in management consulting where those lines become blurred and you're able to, you know, talk about technical scientific things and then package it into a business strategy. And then then you have to take your soft skills for like presentations and that kind of thing and then turn it into something that you can then sell to people So I kind of got that full suite of like all the different things that I wanted to do. Um, And then the third prong as to why I was interested in it was because I grew up internationally um, and I wanted to find a profession that was conducive to me being able to continue living in that kind of lifestyle. And for many professions, like being a doctor or a lawyer, you're you're licensed within a specific jurisdiction. jurisdiction. Um, If you're a management consultant for a technology that can be placed anywhere, you don't have that restriction, right? So it was a combination of the versatility, uh, not really wanting to corner myself in anywhere, a love for tech, and also a love for traveling. Yeah, because you grew up uh, all around Europe, right? In North America, whereabouts? Uh, I went to high school in the Netherlands. I lived in France for a year, lived in Malta for a bit uh, with my family. Um, My family's Irish, so I go there quite a lot. Uh, I lived in Australia, Texas, Canada, so all, all over the place. Yeah, and what's your uh, favorite spot? Toronto, no? Let's go with that, yeah. <laughs> oh, that sounds like yes. a no. That yes. sounds like a no. <laughs> France, is, France just won uh, the semifinals right now, so yeah. they're heading to the finals uh, against Argentina. You're fired up about that. Yeah, I'm ecstatic about that. I'm going to Montreal for uh, Sunday when they play uh, Argentina, That's so that gonna should be, be awesome. Yeah. That's going to be sick. Um, Logan, you were, you were a consultant for a couple firms, actually, right, before moving on to a full-time entrepreneurship? That's correct. Yes. Uh, I started as an independent uh, in like 2015, 16, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was consulting primarily in software. Like I participated big time in some big projects like San Francisco Airport, um, International Airport, uh, pretty much anything software security related. I led the teams jointly with a company called IBI. Um, I 
you know, help McKesson, for example, uh, they've been purchasing Rexall at the time. I've been helping them do like cybersecurity due diligence and product integration. Mm. Yeah. And what first brought you, like what first interested you to get into consulting? Uh, I, I felt like it was a natural flow kind of of things. Um, as in, if you have, you know, an expertise and a skill set, I guess, to apply, right, then you sort of find somebody. And, and this is, you know, how I approach coaching founders, for example. You find somebody who is more or less on the same track or in the same area, but they happen to be like maybe a few steps behind you. So you just simply offer them the expertise, right? Hmm. Um, yeah, you know, and uh, I got recruited by Deloitte um, essentially as a manager, then eventually got promoted to senior manager. I led the threat intelligence practice there, which was the, uh, it was across 12 countries, I think, about four and a half thousand people. Um, so, yeah, then after that I was at EY for uh, an ever brief uh, moment, just ever so briefly for about eight months. Uh, and then after that I quit to uh, start my current company. Amazing. So uh, for those that don't understand necessarily how all of the consulting um, firms work, why don't you talk to me a little bit about you know what are the big firms, how do they differ in expertise or are they all the same and what to look for when choosing like which one to go and work for? That's a great question. Um, so, just like in any, I guess, sector, uh, there's there's a massive difference. You know, you got top top dog uh, players, and then you got kind of like mid tier, and whatnot. Uh, so, sort of universally recognized, like the holy trinity, I guess, uh, is the um, MBB, um, otherwise known as McKinsey, Bain, and BCG, IE, Boston Consulting Group. Mm. Then the next tier after that, but close, close, and they're inching um, ever so closer, uh, is the big four, which is Deloitte, EY. Uh, PwC and KPMG, right? Uh, they kind of, you know, different specialties. Uh, like the big four started as accounting firms. I was going to say, aren't those all accounting firms? Well, they started off as accounting, uh, but then see, the thing is, it's um, some of these firms are over hundred years old, like Deloitte, for instance, and it's difficult to, I guess, resist the temptation of you know increasing uh, LTV, right? Like lifetime value of an account. Uh, when you know you're doing some accounting consulting, and then they're like, "Oh, hey, you know, we need to revamp our management structure, and we need this, and we need that," and uh, they just historically grew in size massively like that. Mm, interesting. And um, so, when choosing what firm to go to, like, what is the big differences between all of them? So, uh, I'd love to know that. Like, is there a difference in ethos? You could jump in if you'd like as well. Is there a difference in ethos, leadership, style, work life balance, compensation? Like, what is the main differences between all of them? Well, so yes to all of the above. Uh, generally, I mean, people set their eye on McKinsey, right? I would say, you know, if, uh, yep. looking at Kieran here, people are like, McKinsey, yes, <laughs> that's where I want to be. Um, so, I know a bunch of guys at McKinsey, I work with them as well. Um, and there are ups and downs. So, the apps are. Uh, Compensation at McKinsey in particular is like triple the industry average. Triple. Triple, yeah. Like as an entry level uh, MBA at McKinsey, you start at about 250K. Wow. Uh, you know, 200, 250, depends on the practice, like risk management, whatever it is. Uh, Deloitte, for example, uh, also is known for like fairly high salaries, but then you'd be starting at maybe like 80 to 100, mm. right? So that's the difference. That being said, um, there's an eligibility question. Like McKinsey almost exclusively likes hiring Ivy League school grads, right? Um, then secondly, I mean, they work your ass. <laughs> like you're, you're, you're earning that in. 200K. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you really are. I mean, you know, and all the way up to the partner and then beyond. Uh, so I've, it's one of the reasons why I've actually quit consulting. But, uh, you know, you, you can be making very, very good money. But essentially the problem is you don't, get a lot of opportunities to use them. Like at Deloitte, I, <laughs> I, I slept in the office about like three, four times. Really? <laughs> These guys got showers there, they got a buffet, there are some beds and stuff. Like they know you're going to be stuck there 24-7. Really? Yeah. So, But then th there's the prestige factor. right? Like you you know, spend a couple of years at Deloitte or McKinsey in particular, you know, from the industry connections perspective, from the experience perspective, and just, just the name recognition, um, it really opens a lot of doors. You can go to banks, you can go to you know tech companies, like you name it, basically. And a lot of people do that. Got it. Yeah. So everyone who's not going to Ivy League, like, then how do they choose between like the big four, let's say? Well, I, I'd go for like Deloitte, Karen. Yeah, I mean, uh, what, one comment I would say about like where... Ex there's the MBBs and then there's the big four and then there's a few others, but like Accenture is always like this like weird orbiter 
mm-hmm. kind of ping ponging between big four stuff and MBB stuff because one way that you can actually explain the difference is that MBB is like pure play strategy. So it's like everything upstream of implementation. So we're just going to give you ideas. You go, okay, cool, thanks. And then that's kind of the best ideas. For, I the guess. best ideas. They're good ideas, but it's why they do a lot of like political consulting and stuff like that because it kind of the full suite of impl- implementation oftentimes isn't there. Uh, when it comes to Deloitte, because they're an accounting firm or any big four company, their implementation is actually extremely good. They do strategy as well, uh, but they, they started off with being able to kind of go into companies, do the actual kind of like reconfiguration. They're extremely good at that. The weird thing about Accenture is that we do both. Mm. And we do both really well, but our main turnkey thing is that we try to go from strategy to implementation and mainly only focus on technology. So it doesn't actually put you in a comparable space to mm. Deloitte or McKinsey. So it's like we're like a different thing in a way. I um, see. And and all these uh, firms, they because you said, well, Deloitte, like you like automatically were like Deloitte. Why is that? Um, and, and by the way, not to, that's definitely not to discount Accenture. Just, there, there are so many, like even IBM, for example, has a great consulting arm as mm-hmm. well, right? Which is in direct competition with some of the stuff that Accenture does or even the big four. Hmm. Um, so, there, I mean, there's a whole host of consulting companies, right? Like there's, uh, yeah, there, there are dozens of them, hmm. even the big ones. Um, so the way I approach these things uh, is... <laughs> It's, it's a bit of a mercenary approach, to be honest. Um, but you look at compensation and then you look at prestige, in my opinion. Um, and it depends. Like, yeah, if you're going to work your way all the way to partner, you got all kinds of options. But if you want to stay there for a couple of years, then leave, right? And then use that expertise to jumpstart your career somewhere else, then prestige is very important. Now, prestige-wise, and this is super subjective, um, McKinsey, Bain, BCG, again, are top uh, choices from that perspective. And then I would say Deloitte um, is number one. Then after that, it gets kind of granular. Like it depends. You know, PwC, for example, has a fantastic uh, like M and A practice. They have a great risk management practice. Uh, KPMG, not so much. Uh, but then KPMG is very strong in other areas. So it really depends where you're trying to go. So let's talk a little bit about that. So each of these like consulting firms have different practices under them, and these practices have different specializations. Mm-hmm. Can you talk to me how like that works? So a lot of people that would be like, oh, so these are just service offerings, but they call them practices. So it's not just a service offering. They're like big departments, though. I mean, conceptually, it's kind of the same, right? Um, With some exceptions, like my time at Deloitte, I was uh, part of Omnia, which is their artificial intelligence uh, practice. (laughs) Why do they call it something different? They have their own name? Um, Well, usually they call practice, you know, it's like risk management, they have accounting and, you know, that type of thing. Um, Omnia, I guess they just thought it sounded cool. But the thing is, they built this up super quickly as well. Like back when Deloitte was building this, um, they went from like having no artificial intelligence practice to having the largest artificial intelligence practice among the big four, at least, in the span of a year. And the way that happened is they bought a bunch of startups. Mm. And I knew some of these startups specifically, right? So the problem with that was uh, these startups joined that ecosystem, which is very different from like, you know, your usual day to day at a startup. I mean, you're, you know, you, you're logging your hours, you're supposed to be billable for most of the time, right? Like you got, you know, it's, it's that's how, well, that's what it's like at one of these like firms, right? Well, yeah. Cause at yeah. a startup, you don't bill your time and like log your hours. Well, yeah, exactly. So, but the, the thing is, so they bought all of these startups, long story short. Um, then in a span of a year, like, I don't know, 40% of that workforce was like, to hell with this. Um, so they waited until like September or so, got their bonuses and checked out. Huh. Um, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> then, which was rather interesting to me, um, you know, the, the practice Wait, still so exists. if they leave, they don't get their bonus? Well, it, it it's prorated, but... Yeah. It, to some extent. Uh, and some of these folks got promoted. So wow, was, don't be giving Valentina any ideas over here. Hey. Um, <laughs> no, but yeah, so the, the practice got significantly, like it, it, it slimmed down quite a bit, like at the end of the year. Um, now they've built it up again, uh, but startups keep leaving because it's just a very different environment. Uh, despite Deloitte's honest, genuine efforts to cultivate that, uh, there's certain overhead that comes with working at one of these firms. And some of this is actually regulatory mandated, so they can avoid that. Um, mm. Karen can probably yeah. Yeah, <laughs> relate to this. Um, yeah, our, our model seems to be that, I mean, we do buy startups, but we do this 
we there's some, one part of the company that I'm involved with actually just works directly with startups and like strategic joint ventures just for the, exactly that reason. Like mm. there's an inherent disconnect between like a massive company and a small company that you're not going to bridge. Uh, but you could still like plug them in in certain scenarios and kind of does that slow them down that. in your opinion or fire them up? Slow down the startups? Yeah. Uh, no, it helps them get really high value clients as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it, it in theory and often in practice, this should help with growth, right? Because imagine, you know, if you're a startup, you join such a developed ecosystem like Deloitte. Uh, so that effectively are, you know, it's like an it's like an accelerator. It's like an incubator, right? And it's free <laughs> for you. Um, so they can get you customers, you get strategic advice, and you get all kinds of resources. So again, theoretically, that accelerates it, but the culture is not always a fit. Mm-hmm. I could get, I could understand that. Okay, so talk to me about career trajectory, junior level up to partner and beyond. What is one? How does one navigate through a management consulting firm or a consulting firm? Well, so it, I can I can take this, Karen. Yeah. Uh, well, it entirely depends on the company. I think does um, it though, or are yeah. they all usually are roughly the same? Well, they're, they're roughly the same, but like what the titles are, how the yeah. different companies want to develop you. Uh, compensation increases are somewhat the same. Um, if you're a publicly traded company, how a partner gets paid is different. But like, if, if I just kind of outline what Accenture is like uh, versus something what like Deloitte is like, um, when you go into Accenture, you're put into an analyst development program because we have so many different practices that you're just, you're underneath the strategy and consulting group, you get put into an analyst development program, you're essentially just working as a support backfill function for any one num- any number of practices in the company. And then once you find one that you're like really interested in learning more about, helping people out, people start to like you, that kind of thing. Somebody- Then you I'd, pick one? You don't pick one, they pull you into it. Hmm. I mean, you can pick one, but it's not a good idea. Like you want them to hmm. pull you into it because then, you know, they, they like you and can develop you. And at that point, you're, you're a consultant. Um, and then once you're a consultant, you're doing exactly what consultants do. You're consulting, going out to the client, you're fully competent on your own. Um, and then once you do that for a few years, you be generally become a manager. And th- this is where the Accenture model and like Deloitte and everything start to like line up. It's like you have go from consultant to manager. Um, and then does a manager like normal managers m- like manage people? Yeah, they well, they'll manage like a project or multiple projects. Hmm. Um, and they'll have consultants or analysts underneath them. And then above them will be a principal director, managing director, uh, or if you're talking about uh, MBB or the big four, it might be like a partner um, who's leading the client relationship. He's that person, he or she is running a larger suite of projects. Mm-hmm. Um, and the manager is basically just responsible for managing the people, delivering on the deadlines. They're primarily accountable for it. Um, and after a while, that manager will then be able to buy in to become a uh, partner or managing director. Yeah, interesting. Um, g- it varies the timeline and how that works varies across companies, but that's kind of how it works. I understand. It, broad strokes, it, it is very much like that. Uh, there is often a distinction, probably like just past the manager point, where essentially, and they're not going to tell you this unless you know you're, um, you're unless you're, it's too late. And uh, no, no, unless your coach <laughs> unless is being you're like, already in there and unless, it's too no, late. No, no, unless your coach is being extra honest. Um, so they're not going to tell you this, but basically, you either choose or it is chosen for you whether you're going to focus on essentially leading internal projects as like a subject matter expert. At Deloitte, you would then, after being a manager, for example, you'd become a lead, then a senior lead, then typically like a director. Mm -hmm. And the difference is you slowly get less and less of a life as you (laughs) go up that Mm. or the opposite? Well, you know, you definitely get less of a life. I mean, you know, uh, I was working with a partner named Bryson Tan, who is a fantastic guy, by the way, at EY. And, uh, you know, I had to pick him up at like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Like this guy worked his ass off. Wow. He was with the firm for like a decade. Um, anyway, so, but one way is you become an SME and you remain an employee. And then the top tier for you is like a director or a lead of some practice. You work on internal projects and stuff like that. So this is them typically telling you, you don't have what it takes to be a partner. Um, so <laughs> yep. alternatively, um, after a manager, if you do theoretically at least have what it takes to be a partner and become, let's say, senior manager, and then more often than not, have to make a business case uh, for them to make you like a junior partner. In some firms, uh, this is still like an employee position. In some others, this is already like an equity position. Um, regardless, 
when you become a partner, you technically quit the firm, then you buy in, right? Uh, it's like a law firm. And then your compensation is pretty much tied to the stock ownership that you have. Only the stock ownership? You pretty much just, yeah, you don't get compensated as a salaried employee once mm. you're a, an equity partner. And then there are various clauses and stuff, but long story short, again, when you retire, um, the, the firm typically has the option to buy the stock back. Yeah, but uh, this stock comp can you can imagine is you know scales massively. I mean, it's not unusual for like first year partners to make like six, eight hundred k. Second year partners, like if you're not sitting on your hands, you know, uh, uh, over a million, right? Like wow. and so on and so on. So it gets pretty good, but again, like the the level of pressure and the the, the workload that these folks have is is crushing. And yeah. you you mentioned uh, it's them not telling you you have what it takes. What is it? That it takes oh, sales, sales, sales. Yeah. sales? Takes, That's yeah, it. It's sales. It's sales. it's they they are they, they, yeah. You, you, the way Logan put it is perfect. You can either become an SME and know you know I know is everything there is to know about five G tech. It's like okay, cool. You can build out the blueprints. What, what does SME like? stand for? Subject matter expert. Thank yeah. you. Um, that person will be extremely valuable for this one vertical. Um, then there's more so, and this is where strat- upstream strategy comes into play. Like, if you have a manager, managing director, p- or partner, depending on the language, in strategy, who's just like a general industry advisor, and he's sort of like whispering in the ear of all of these CEOs in the financial sector or something, he's selling projects. He's like pushing things through the pipeline. It's like, okay, your company should do this. We can do that. Our partner, Microsoft, is able to do this, or, you, you know, like that, they're pushing things through the pipeline so that it's sales in less of like a grindy Wolf of Wall Street way and more of just like a injecting things or frameworks into companies. And then that that results in projects and that results in the MD getting money. And then that's, yeah, it's sales. As a partner, you're supposed to make basically a 10x ROI at the very least on your comp. Yeah. Um, as a director, it's the ROI on you for the firm is a lot more elusive because you're basically an employee. But again, the potential is very different. Like as a director, you're going to get maybe like three, 400K. If you're really good, you're going to lead some practice. As a partner, you're going to pass that like in year or two. Right. Um, so, and that kind of is a nice segue. So I typically say that there are two essentially career paths at these firms. One is you get in, you work your butt off for like three years, let's say, two, three years, you know. You make a bunch of industry connections, uh, typically with uh, clients, you know, you let projects for them and whatnot, which effectively acts as like an extended interview. You know, hopefully they like you, hopefully they think you're good. So then you go out there and then they hire you. Yeah, mm-hmm. or like, you like do your own thing, and now they're your clients. Uh, that well, like that never. It, it can work like that. I mean, <laughs> do you not to get sued. Yeah, not. Well, <laughs> not I guess you don't want to get sued by one of those guys, one of those firms. Yeah, yeah, but it depends where you are. Like non-solicitation clauses are notoriously a pain in the butt to um, enforce, mm-hmm. right? Um, but anyway, so that's that's like out of um, scope here. Yeah, yeah. But basically, yeah. So you can start your own <laughs> thing, but more often than not, you stay there for a couple of years. You go, you work at like a bank, for instance, and then again, this is typically like a higher level than you were at the consulting firm. Like if you're a consultant, you go there, you're going to be like some kind of senior manager there. And then see, the thing is, these consulting firms, they love that as well, because now they have an inside guy or gal. Right. Right. Oh, interesting. So it's kind of like, it's very much like one hand washes the other. Um, And then another approach is you pretty much prepare yourself for like like a decade of grinding, and then you get to partner. And then, you know, in the 80s and the 70s, after that, you could relax a little bit. And we did an internal study at Deloitte, and that actually showed that partner uh, performance does take a a significant uh, dive after like three or four years. Why is that? Uh, They just get burned out, I think. Previously, like if you watched, um, I don't know, Mad Men or Mm -hmm. something like that, right? Like you you do get to relax a little bit, I guess. Like, you, you know, you kind of paid your dues. Modern environment with how quickly, you know, everything is changing, the technology, the requirements, all that stuff, you pretty much have to keep working your ass off and it's just constant grind, grind, grind. Yeah. I mean, yeah. When, when you're at that level, you're also not just like sitting on the ownership of like a factory with processes that's mm-hmm. producing output and you could just sort of sit around and get cash flow. Like that's not at all what's happening. Like you're, it's always be closing at that point. You're just constantly yep. <laughs> having to sell so that, that it li- quite literally just becomes your lifestyle and vocation just to be giving advice to C-suites and selling them on ideas and things. Interesting. Okay, so uh, two last questions before we shift gears, okay? So uh, both of you, what does a typical day look like 
in the consulting world? Well, uh, for me, as a, as a management, it was mostly well managing projects, first of all. Um, secondly, if you're um, on a partner track, which is where you, well, you probably want to be there, um, you got to like start bringing in some revenue and some business for that business case, right? Like, you know, sales, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so typically it's just, you know, I, I would have anywhere between like three and, I don't know, eight to nine projects, uh, each with their own team. Right, um, and then I would sort of have this like main thing that I was leading, which is the threat intelligence practice. Uh, but m- mine was not typical. Like my career was not typical. It was not a typical day of a manager um, because that first piece was yeah pretty normal. The second piece, leading a practice, was something more like closer to what a, like a senior lead or like a director would do. Um, so you know we would like figure out how to group uh, products and how to rebrand, how to go to market, like you know that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's not necessarily typical. And then, yeah, and then occasionally somebody just, you know, yanks you and say, oh, I have this like high priority RFP, like drop everything and just work on that. Uh, Kieran is nodding here like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, 80 hour work week out of nowhere. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're like just sitting there on a Wednesday night. You're like, oh, I think I'm going to take off in like two hours since nine o'clock. Um, and then somebody, and then somebody pulls you in and they're like, yeah, no, you're not. holy shit okay interesting yeah accurate or yes 100 percent. if you're sitting in the office like in the cafeteria area let's say and you know even if you're just hanging out have your laptop in front of you and just be typing some random stuff otherwise a partner is going to walk by and just be like follow me (laughs) (laughs) and then you're you're done like you just got to go do stuff really okay but in my case in terms of uh daily life right now i'm uh project managing uh, or doing the initial kind of framing up for uh, implementation of something that I can't really talk about in January and February. Um, And right now it's literally just, I wake up at like my my team is, I have a one dude in Europe that I'm working with. So I have to wake up at like seven, hop on a stand up call, show like a status slide. This is kind of like what the in-flight actions are. Here's what the risks to, you know, being on time on budget, everything are. Um, and then I just go throughout the day, kind of like getting syncing up the necessary meetings with the right people, with the right partners, that kind of thing, just making sure all of our ducks and ducks are in a row. Um, and yeah, you're essentially just making sure that everything is organized all the time, getting in meetings, being like, hey, person, where's this thing that we need in order to do this very critical, important action? And that guy will be like, oh, I need to talk to this person. And then you kind of just organize it. Like, that's where I'm at now, um, which... I'm only doing that for one project, but that's how you develop out the skills in order to do it for multiple projects, which is what Logan was talking about as a manager. Um, so yeah, but th- there's there's other projects where I've been on where it's much more like you, you'll you be in a quote unquote brainstorming session for like three and a half hours with a manager doing whiteboarding, trying to figure out some sort of strategy. And then you'll do another like three hours putting it into a deck and then you'd present it and I'm, I'm, I'm getting like Vietnam flashbacks. Yeah, listening to this. <laughs> yeah. okay. when, when, when you're low in the ladder, there's a lot of like, "What the hell am I even doing right now?" <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for that. Thanks for sharing. Still that. hear them late at night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so uh, you know, all these partners are probably like in their fifties. No, is there any partners that are like thirties? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Like at Omnia, again, it was pretty unusual because. Um, a lot of these startups got purchased either on a condition or otherwise they basically schmooze their way in of becoming a partner. Ah, I see. Upon so purchase. They would come over. Yeah, so I think the youngest partner of Match was like 32, which is, you know, pretty, well, very, very young for a partner, right? So, okay. but, but, but normally... Well, like my, my, my point is like, uh, you're a certified Gen Z, okay? What's it like <laughs> working in like a probably, I don't know if it's male-dominated or tra- traditionally kind of like that kind of more traditional old school way of like doing business as a younger generation? Is there a culture clash? You're in the middle as Um, a millennial. I'd love to hear your opinion on the older people and managing the younger people. Honestly, to the extent that there's any culture clash, it's more so just the proclivity for my generation to want to insert humor into all situations, no matter how serious. <laughs> it's Marvel. <laughs> I blame Marvel. Yeah. <laughs> so being in, in calls where people are extremely... Uh, serious. Serious about everything, uh, that, that can get kind of annoying because yep. that's just not how... I, maybe it's a generational thing, but that's not how my brain works, not how a lot of the other people at my level's brain works, you know? Uh, but other than that, no, I, I find it 
<laughs> at least in Accenture, everybody to be very like kind of there, there's no like technology gap where you're like people are asking you how to like shift PDFs and stuff like that. Like everyone knows how to do that. So mm. you're more so just learning off of other people's industry expertise, which is a good position to be in when you're young. So you never know though. This one time at Deloitte was leading a project it was for one of the big banks and um, I needed them to put together basically a financial analysis presentation. So I gave them all the data, all that stuff, kind of explain how to do it. And I was, you know, pretty much expecting this by the next day. I mean, it's a, it's a PPTX for God's sakes. Yeah. Right. So next day, nothing. Next day, nothing. You know, like three, four days pass. I'm like, what's going on? They're like, oh, you're going to get it by Friday. I'm like, all right. So anyway, we sit down, we, you know, I kind of look through the deck and, um, and I mean, I'm, I'm a guy who's written a book on design. So I'm looking through this and it looks kind of shifty. I'm like, mm, this doesn't look right. So anyway, I start poking at the elements and you see, they didn't use the charts tool. They drew every single chart by hand. <laughs> mm-hmm. And yeah. the person was like a fresh college grad. I sat down with them and was like, what did you do in college? <laughs> That's pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't come off well in the story either. I come off as a massive asshole. But um, I was pretty frustrated, to be honest, because I was like, dude, like, what's taking you so long? Um, so not everyone. And that guy was young, too. So there you go. I mean, yeah. the, the, the whole reason why the first two years of you being in consulting are like the stereotypical, oh, yeah, you're just going to be like a slide deck monkey kind of thing is that you're, if you spend t- two years straight for like 60, 70 hour work weeks, just like <laughs> slamming out slide decks and financial models, you get so good at just doing that with your eyes closed at the end of it that, you know, c- come having to be a manager and focusing on sales, you don't have to actually think or worry about putting together the materials or like how to actually build the artifacts that you need. It's just sort of second nature at that point because you spent the the 10,000 hours on, on developing out that skill set. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, so I want to shift gear for the last 20 minutes here because yeah. one of the biggest things that um, a lot of us have been hearing about over the last like year or so are these big cybersecurity hacks mm. and cybersecurity this, make sure you're protected that way, leaks here. It's very confusing and somewhat scary, but not a lot of people think about it still. And I think it's something that uh, more people should be talking about, which is like the concept of cybersecurity and what the threats could be in the future and what you could do in order to protect yourself. So I do know that you transitioned uh, or you were working in cybersecurity, Logan, um, at Deloitte. And then you went off to start your own uh, startup in the space. Why don't you talk to me a little bit about A, what it was like leading up to it because taking that leap from probably a comfy job in the consulting world to go become an entrepreneur was probably not the easiest decision for a lot of people to make. Um, And then we'll transition to what the company is and what you do. Uh, Thank you. Well, yeah, it can be jarring, uh, jarring uh, primarily because, yeah, you know, the job is pretty cushy. Yeah. Um, I left for, you know, just main three reasons, I guess, uh, in in no particular um, order of significance. Um, First of all, uh, political situations in these firms are... Uh, and, and again, nobody's going to talk about this stuff, you know. I just, I, I, I don't give a shit. So, <laughs> but uh, the political situation, most of these firms, like, there's a lot of backstabbing. There's a lot of, you know, like uh, tit for tat, quid pro quo type situations. You name it. Uh, it, it just gets very frustrating, you know. If, I could imagine it's like a bunch of, yeah, like probably if, borderline sociopathic, hard driving, strong, you know, smart, ambitious, money hungry people. That's gonna. Yeah. That's gonna. Could potentially do that. Right? It's highly competitive. It's very much like up or out. Yeah. Um, particularly when you get to like manager, senior manager, like there's so much pressure. And then they have the balls to release like work life balance white papers, you know, <laughs> telling you like, you know, don't check your phone or email after seven p.m. <laughs> You're like, well, if I don't check it, Janet's gonna check it. And who do you think is gonna make senior manager next year? <laughs> yeah. You know. So um, didn't get promoted because I was too busy meditating. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> really? So like, yeah, wow. In, in theory, it's all kumbaya, but on, in practice, like no way. So mm. that's one. Anyway, that's one. Um, then the second one was the fact that you don't, in my opinion, some people would disagree, and I can see where they're coming from. You don't get to take ownership of of your work, um, right? Because you, you're getting other people uh, to do something. You're helping them to do something, and they get to take the credit. Right, mm. and I'm not talking about partners, even though they do take the credit very much. So I'm talking about uh, you know your clients, 
Yeah, mm. it's very fulfilling. First, you know, overall you feel valued. You're helping these folks. You do this for a year, two, five years. You're like, you know, what do I put on my resume, right? Um, so that's the second reason. Um, and then the third one was just the uh, just the relentless. Um, it's like you're constantly in crisis mode. You know, like you just you just work hard Why? all the t- well, like well, because there's always some super urgent RFP or project or something like that. Like you just there's no like slow period. Also, uh, because companies hire us to manage their crises. Mm, so. Yeah, Ex- that that's also that's actually a very good point. Exactly, because you're a consultant yeah. for a reason. And the thing is, you're either <laughs> you're either billable or you're failing, right? So if you're failing, that's a whole other problem. And if you're not failing, that just you know pretty much means you're busy all the time. Um, and there's like, <laughs> and there's like no end in sight. You only get busier. People think, oh, I'm going to be a manager. I'm going to be less busy. Nope. Senior manager still busier. Partner, you're still busier. And then you're just pretty much busy until you're dead. So, you know, and. <laughs> Come to consulting. We have cookies. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, like honestly, like you know, this guy Bryson, like I said, as a partner, um, had a passion for cars. He had a, a Nissan GTR tuned to like twelve hundred horsepower. It was nuts. Um, and then he drove it. I don't know, like once a week. Yeah, never gets to use it. Yeah, like he yeah. just sat in a garage, and that that really sums it up for me. Holy um, shit. Okay, so that was an easy leave for you. But uh, like, what led up to it? Like, so what what was the decision making through your head? You obviously had an idea for a business. Hmm. You wanted to like take the full leap, right? Like lead us up to people that are also thinking of doing that. What went through your head and what the logic was? Well, you just have to have a good idea and you have to have a good team, right? Um, when I left Deloitte, uh, I have this um, so this guy who was leading the program with me, his name is Martin Gill, uh, and the guy's a regular James Bond. I mean, he's got like 20 years experience as an MI6 operative. Uh, so he's, you know, he's pretty cool. He's in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I sent my uh, email saying like, okay, I'm out of here. Uh, literally half an hour, he's like, hold my beer. And then he quit as well. So <laughs> that's pretty funny. And he was like, what are you up to? I'm like, oh, I'm going to start a company. He's like, let's do this together. Um, so, and that's pretty much what happened. But like, we we frankly didn't have a good idea exactly right away what we wanted to do. We just knew that we wanted to do something cybersecurity wise, build a product. Um, why cybersecurity? Or why did you get into it in the first place? Uh, that was years ago. I mean, I, I saw this as a hot market. It's a common denominator among pretty much any technology product or service, right? It's just there. You know, I was doing you know, this project, like I said, for San Francisco Airport. Cybersecurity was a big part of it. Phantom Games, cybersecurity was a big part of it. McKesson, you know, you get the idea, right? And I was like, okay, I want to just do cybersecurity. And that's how I got into it. Hmm. Um, and it, yeah, you, you know, the, the more technology we have, the more complicated it gets, the less secure it gets. Complexity is not an enemy, um, sorry, is not a friend of security. Right. Um, so that's kind of how I got into it. But the thing is, there's a huge problem with cybersecurity. If you look at last year's losses, like $6 trillion lost to cyber attacks, it's an insane number. Right. So, okay, but we have all these companies, all these products that help, you know, handle cybersecurity. So what's, where's the disconnect? So in our opinion, at Orna, the disconnect is that it's not enough to detect a cyber attack. You have to respond to it. Right. And there's so many detection methods and policies and tools. There's all kinds of stuff. But basically shit happens. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and what a lot of companies don't know how to do or they don't even want to look sometimes at that subject is how do you actually respond to that efficiently? Almost all of the high profile breaches just have been mishandled in terms of response. Uber, Colonial Pipeline, Verizon. These companies were able to detect these attacks quickly. They had the infrastructure to protect themselves, but they really fumbled that response action from communications to legal to mitigation to all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we built a tool that pretty much automates most of that. Amazing. Uh, that's like actually unreal. Uh, how's it been going so far? Because I think you, uh, you've been around for a year and a half, two years now. No, we launched in April. It's just about eight months. Oh, um, shit. Really? Yeah, we're at this point. Killing it. Well, no, no, it's good. Uh, we are actually uh, at this point nominated as a top ten fastest growing companies in North America. Wow, that's nice. nice. We've won uh, a couple of awards, like best AI driven cyber incident response platform, um, something, something else. We just won the Global Tech Challenge. Uh, it was five thousand startups uh, competing for, uh, like, to address infrastructure challenges globally. So uh, this is actually pretty fresh, and we're going to be now deployed in I think four hundred plus cities in Europe uh, to protect them from geopolitical threats. You know, certain countries are getting out of hand. 
<laughs> and uh, we got to do something about that. So. Why don't you talk to me about what was the like craziest cyber uh, attack that you that you've seen um, that like interested you the most? So, quick asterisk: like, there's a lot of uh, the, the, the big parts of my job that I can talk about. Like, one of our customers is actually the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. Uh, so you can imagine we have some interesting stuff going on there. Um, but aside from that, um, yeah, there was this one breach that uh, it was like a, it was like a detective story because we've been looking at essentially it was a large uh, organization. I'm really trying to like tiptoe around the details here. Um, it was a large organization, long story short, um, and they've been looking at the ransomware attack. And the more we kept investigating that, um, the more we realized that it, it's just. It, it's too inconvenient. Like it's it's needlessly inconvenient, essentially. And the main point of contact uh, within that organization was their um, IT director, who was with the company for a decade, right? Um, and he just kept like, oh, you know, we don't have router logs because we don't save them. You know, like oh, you can't get access to this network because I lost the password. You know, stuff like that, right? And it was just getting pretty suspicious. And again. Uh, Long story short, we have discovered that he did actually collude with um, the ransomware group to extort his company. Oh shit! What's ransomware, by the way, for the people that don't know? Uh, it's it's a type of malware that uh, gets into your network, and one way or another, it basically blocks you from using your assets effectively, right? And then unless it you like pay money or something, yeah, which typically cryptocurrencies these days. And if they pay, do they usually give it back? You know what? Surprisingly, yes, um, because some of these organizations have customer support. Customer support. Yeah. <laughs> I shit you not. They have a twenty four seven live chat, all that kind of stuff. They give you discounts if you pay fast. I mean, it's a business. It's a massive business. Like we're not talking about you know people sitting in basements. These are huge companies. You know, folks wake up in the morning, you know, kiss their wife and kids, and then go extort companies nine to five, <laughs> go back home have dinner. And where do these uh, people come from? Uh, like, is it all over, or major countries, uh, the, organizations, mob groups? Is the Italian mob in this yet, or it's what? Only the Italian mob is <laughs> definitely in this in some shape or form. But uh, so, typically, the the, the highest uh, threat level is organizations that are called nation st- state sponsored actors, otherwise known as APT, Advanced Persistent Threat. Those are like large organizations sponsored by national governments. Um, some of the usual suspects you got Russia, Iran, North Korea. You know that sort of thing, um, and we do see them a lot in in the cyberspace. Um, really, that's not just rumors. Legit. No, no, not at all. Absolutely, um, but they exist in you know like there are U.S. organizations, or Canadian organizations to a lesser extent. So yeah, mm. wow. The Canadian organizations just ask please after the one million dollar yeah, ransom. At least the Canadian ones apologize. That's They're different. very polite. Yeah. yeah. The problem, like, if you want to call it that, we have in Canada is that we actually don't get attacked a lot. Mostly, when we get attacked, is people are just using our infrastructure to kind of like pivot into the U.S. Like let's say energy grid because it's shared. Mm-hmm. Um, but Canada is kind of in a relaxed headspace cybersecurity wise um, because we are not a priority target. You know, we don't have a huge army or fleet uh, or geopolitical presence. We're not one of the five eyes um, in any significant way. What are the five eyes? It's a cooperation between five leading countries, cybersecurity-wise, essentially. we were part of the five eyes. No, we are. That's why I said uh, not in any oh. significant way, unfortunately. Oh, okay, I, uh, I mean, Canadian GCHQ... So what are they? Can you explain that a little bit to me for those that don't understand or haven't heard of that before? Yeah, you got like Australia, US, you know, UK, like the usual suspects pretty much. And um, Canada's in there. Is there only five of them? All, all the English-speaking countries have and, like a and shared they, intelligence And they created system. this intelligence system to do what? Well, they share intelligence primarily um, among each other on both domestic and external cyber threats. Oh, fascinating. Okay. Yeah, so it's a real thing. It was also in the James Bond movie, but it is a real thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, enough said. But basically, again, like I, I'm a strong advocate towards, uh, you know, for Canada increasing our geopolitical presence, whether that's G8 or otherwise, including cybersecurity, uh, you know, budgets, policies, mandates, all that type of stuff. Why don't you talk to me a little bit about what... Uh Talk to me a bit about how Canadians could be protecting themselves. Like you work at the institutional level, but what can the everyday Canadian a look out for to be a, to be weary of to prevent something from happening? And two, how should they respond if something were to happen? And give us a little bit of like layman's terms, uh, like 
descriptive words that you use in the industry? Well, so frankly speaking, you're not going to you know hear anything surprising. Probably this has been said like a thousand times. Um, one of the things you can do is uh, secure passwords. I mean, this is super basic, right? Everybody says that for one reason. It's true. You know, don't use your passwords. Use a password manager like LastPass, for example. You know. Generate secure, unique passwords for especially your like mission critical uh, assets, like your bank account, perhaps. Um, on top of that, use multi-factor authentication, right? Which is basically when they send you an SMS or otherwise. You know, SMS is not the most secure way; they can be intercepted, but it's something, you mm-hmm. know. So the thing is, um, whatever you do, it's made more difficult by, for example, governments. Like recently, there was a huge breach of uh, COVID nineteen vaccinated individuals. So it was over three hundred thousand people. So if you are affected, you're going to get a letter soon notifying you of that. Really? Uh, is and that the from is, the app? The $30 million um, app that... Uh, 30, it's like, it's like up to 80 at this point. Holy shit. Um, did they end up finding a quick side note? Did they end up looking into it? They did an audit, did they? They're still looking into it. Uh, there are some very interesting things. Like they've listed a bunch of companies uh, whom they've alleg- allegedly paid to develop or I've can. Then like three of these companies reached back and said that we haven't heard anything about that or received this money. Oh, that's sketchy. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely a developing story. Mm. Okay. But anyway. my, my point is this though. Um, so you can do many things to prevent you know yourself from getting attacked, primarily passwords, MFA, things like that. Just hygiene, don't pick up weird numbers and whatnot. Well, but it's surprising how many people don't do just simply those two things. That is true, but the thing is, like, it's usually organizations that lose your data to cyber criminals, and effectively, there's more or less nothing you can do. Mm. You know, like if a Canadian government experiences a leak, like, you know, the one that happened just now, I mean, you have no say in that, pretty much. Um, so I guess it's just a reality of things. Um, I mean, you can also change your passwords, like more often than not, um, but. Most likely, Fuck. all of our day days online. So. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. It's all okay. Gloom. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll uh, wrap up. Five, ten more minutes, Valentina. <laughs> um, so, in your opinion, what's on the horizon for cybersecurity? Tell me the good, the bad, the ugly. What makes you excited or optimistic about the future? Um, so, so many things. Cybersecurity is not necessarily one of them, but I like, you know, fusion energy, for instance, I think is a winner. Ooh. But um, it has been some progress a couple of days ago. It's fantastic yeah. to hear. Um, so <sighs> quantum computing is going to play a huge role. right? Quantum has a strong effect on cybersecurity. A lot of cybersecurity ciphers are based on an assumption that it's going to take too long for a conventional computer to crack, like sometimes thousands of years. But is quantum computing actually practical yet? Well, no, not yet. Uh, there are no commercial applications that I know of. Uh, but there are prototypes, and eventually it's going to reach commercial viability. At which point, it's going to disrupt just about everything. I mean, you know, from investing to you know medical research and so on. But cybersecurity is included in that. So we're going to need to. I mean, there's already uh, promising research in that. You know, this quantum cryptography. There's all kind of cool stuff, right? But basically, yeah, that's going to be a huge game changer. Second is advances in artificial intelligence. Um, some attacks are already using AI, such as uh, as a type of attack that's called a polymorphic attack, where basically it changes itself as you try to, um, you know, nail it down, right? So now we have adversarial AIs. So it's like AI versus AI. Holy shit! That's yeah, like out of a movie. <laughs> battling it out in cyberspace. Uh, so one AI can, for example, let, let's say you're using an AI to protect your system, and you're operating. On a certain like baseline assumption, like okay, like on a normal, like this is normal traffic flow, for example, at the most basic level, right? So an enemy AI can basically very slowly but gradually increase the flow of, tra- of traffic to your server so that your AI adopts what it considers a baseline and then effectively try to sneak an attack, like a denial of service attack, underneath that. So there's all kind of cool stuff going on. Hmm. But yeah, AI quantum. Have you uh, seen the new uh, AI chatbot that or? Uh, Chat mm-hmm. GP, was it called? Chat, G- Chat GT, GPT. GPT. Have you seen that? Yeah. I, I've seen that, but I mean, there's all kind of. Have amazing you played stuff. with it yet? I it's did a hilarious. little bit. It's I used to funny. pay Kieran like hundreds of dollars a month to write <laughs> blog posts. This thing. Yeah, but there are. It's at least the same. It's at least the same as what how good you were. 
Kieran is not going uh, enough good here. No, I, think, I think I'm marginally good. <laughs> I don't know. It's <laughs> pretty fucking scarily good. There's AI that does paintings. You know, there's Dallas. I saw that one. I right. saw that one. There's AI that generates music for you, different genres and all that like, stuff. Like, hey, um, can we do our next, <laughs> Jesse, our next um, podcast episode? I want the, uh, the line of questioning done by that chat bot. I want to see what happens. Ooh, I like that a lot, actually. That's, that is awesome. <laughs> this is awesome. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so, yeah, that's crazy. What's, uh, what are you optimistic about the future? <sighs> um, I think with the whole pandemic normalizing, you know, pe- people working remotely between countries, between locations... Like I worked for you guys from a different country for a long time. That was uh, fun. Yeah, I, I think that will open up, uh, you know, to say, you know, all you need is a good idea and a good team. The fact that teams can be built remotely and globally from the very beginning is going to have a pretty massive impact, in my opinion. And I think that's the primary thesis behind what Meta is doing. Uh, I think a lot of people are going, it's what got me interested in telecom. It's It's... Very exciting just to see what that will imply because, you know, ha- having pe- two people work together that are that are perfectly fit, you- you're not always going to find that in the same city as you. The, yeah. you. the correct mentor, the correct team member, the whatever it may be, they're not always going to be geographically located in the same spot. So the potential that, you know, remote work, to call it what we've been calling it, has is going to be very interesting to see play out. I love that. Okay, last question. I've been asking this at the end of every single podcast. I want to thank both of you guys for coming on. You guys are beauties. I'd, I could literally do a three-hour podcast with you guys, so we'll definitely have to do a follow-up. We should do that. We yeah. need more alcohol, though. Super do down. That. 100%. As you guys know, it's called What They Didn't Teach You in School. A lot of things that we talk about are not taught in school. Yeah. Um, so we, we thought of this question for this season to ask everyone at the end of each podcast. So I will go one of each of you. What's one piece of wisdom you've learned that you wish you had a lot sooner? Um, oh, okay. Um, so for me, that's, uh, well, I don't know how to phrase this, you know, beautifully, but basically just do your thing, you know, without binding other people's opinions on that. So I'm not saying, you know, ignore reasonable advice, but basically if you're concerned about like appearances or perceptions and things like that, just forget about it, do your thing, because it matters to other people a lot less than you think it does. I love that. Okay. Kieran? Um, there's two. One of them is basically just a one-phrased anecdote, and that's jump and the net will appear. Hmm. Take the risk. Do it. Um, you know, Reach out to whoever you want to reach out to. Ask that person out. Ask for a job. Ask for that project. Just ask for what you want. Um, took me a while to figure out how often that tends to actually work out. Um, but if there's any piece of wisdom that has actually carried me pretty far since I figured it out is that there's a fundamental um, and diametrically opposed difference between critical thinking and creative thinking. Um, critical thinking is exactly that. It's critical. You're breaking things down. You have one thing. You're, you're analyzing it, breaking it down into its component parts, Um, And you're essentially just understanding the system better. Uh, Creative thinking is different. You're taking a bunch of different things, smaller things, and you're synthesizing them together, merging them, turning it into one thing. Those are two separate things. And if you can figure out a way to like analyze, understand a system, multiple systems using your critical thinking skills, then you're more well equipped to then make creative leaps that other people can't see because you are able to break things down into their smaller parts and then combine them in unique ways to create something new. Um, once I figured that out, I was, you know, I, 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 in my opinion, I got a lot smarter. So eloquently put, yeah, eloquently put guys, thank you so much for being on this episode. There will be another time. Um, and we do, we do appreciate you, um, just like sharing all this stuff, particularly you, because, you know, you're not working at a big firm right now. So you could actually like to, uh, say those kinds of things. So appreciate you, Logan. Um, yeah, I had to keep my mouth shut. Yeah, <laughs> so that you don't get sued. <laughs> but one time, once you actually leave, 
then we'll have you back on again. If I leave. Kira's like, no comment. <laughs> if. No comment. Accenture, if you're listening, if. I love you. <laughs> for everyone for everyone at home listening, we all appreciate you too. And until next time, this is What They Did Not Teach You in School. Valentina, take us out.